up. Like, tell me a little bit about when you grew up. Like, was it easy for you to be yourself? Or do you think there were certain, like, expectations that you had to fit into? I love the question because I reflect on it a lot in that I think my professional career was definitely shaped by this in a way that maybe isn't as common for people because my parents are first gen and I was raised in an environment where my mom's a teacher, my dad's an optometrist and they're very involved with the community. So my friends growing up were my parents' friends. I thought I was an adult at the table, just like everybody else. In fact, I didn't speak at all until I was about two and a half. And then I just spoke in full adult sentences overnight. It was totally weird. And it was one of those, I was learning two languages, Spanish is my first language. And so there's a lot of processing you know, going on. And when I finally started speaking up, I was at the table with adults. And so I knew since I was a little kid that you talk to your friends and family differently than you speak at a community event where my parents were taking me and I was being a little adult because I wanted to be, because I enjoyed having the adult conversations. I didn't really feel like playing with the kids. I did have friends, but you know, I like to be in the mix with the adults and know what's going on. So anyway, I say that like in, in a positive sense, because it wasn't, it didn't feel like I was faking it. It didn't feel like I have to be this other version of myself. It was just a different side of me. Or, you know, I got to talk about smart things with these adults or just bring a different flavor, even though I could be both, right? It's like being, I think for myself, being a Latina raised in the US, I'm 200%. I'm a, th I'm, I'm a thousand percent, all the things, but I'm 100% Latina. I'm also 100% American. What does that look like, right? Like when I'm in Mexico, it's not the same with my family that lives there. They are surprised I listen to music in Spanish. And I'm like, do you understand? I live and breathe reggaeton like all the time, <laughs> but I'm not going to be Mexican. I'm not from there, right? So there's a difference. And so that factored in with my parents navigating these different worlds where they didn't grow up like that. They evolved into that. Their friends are also first-gen professionals. And so I often tell my friends, I'm like what your kids will be like, because I just, I'm the next generation in many ways. And I think it's really cool to know how to navigate these environments, still be ourselves, know how to play with that volume dial. And sometimes code switch, sometimes there's language I wouldn't use around my friends or professionals. You know, like we have this whole, it's like either a toolkit or our whole art kit of ways we can paint our lives, you know? And um, so anyway, so I was raised by two Mexican American parents. My dad was born in Mexico but moved when he was four. And so he was raised here. And my mom and her parents were born in the US, even though my grandparents didn't speak English, like very much on the border until they came to California. So anyway, so that upbringing of deeply rooted in culture and community, my mom was big on always showing up, supporting in, in the community in all types of ways, either educational efforts, church things, political campaigns, marches, all of that. And yeah, it influenced my career a lot because it taught me what it means to show up for a community, know how to dress up or dress down and know what it looks like. To, I was in a little pantsuit when I was little at Easter. And I was like, why did my mom dress me like that? Cause she dressed me like what she would wear sometimes. <laughs> and it was those things that it's like, that was weird. But now I understand cause I can wear a pantsuit and it's not foreign to me because they, they raised me like this was normal to be able to be in all these spaces and just pick from the wardrobe you want, pick from the colors you want to paint with, like I said. That's so interesting. So you feel like by the time you got to, you know, corporate America or your career, you were, you were ready because you were already mixing in so many of these environments. Yeah. I mean, I think about it. Like when my friends, when I talk to them in their first gen, they're going to raise their kids with that perspective. hundred percent. They're going to be like, why would I not teach you that I learned the ropes? Of, I learned how the game works. That sometimes you need to wear a certain outfit. Sometimes you need to come correct or clean up or have this way of communicating. So my parents gifted me that, you know, and that was really valuable. Ironically though, I got to to work and then I realized, oh, my cultural and, and community uh, infused perspective is really valuable professionally. I had an executive that I was working with once tell me, thank your parents for teaching you Spanish because that was exactly why I was working on this. So it was like my parents gifted me a lot of experience that taught me how to code switch and navigate things. I didn't know that's what it was. I just knew you act a certain way around certain people. That's it. But I also knew like my mom's side was way more lively, energetic. My dad's side is much more serious. So I already knew how to pivot in different ways. But yeah, I mean, in the corporate setting, it did definitely feel similar to things that I experienced growing up, but on a whole different level. Like I went to Harvard undergrad, nothing prepared me for that. <laughs> the yeah. level of privilege I was around, like it was an insanely different experience in my upbringing, but it was like, oh, when I turn it on with my parents community events or whatever now it's that all the time or in a at a corporate table it's that times 10 even more so i can't say that i don't know if anyone can say 
that they raised in like a, a Latin household that prepared them for corporate America. I don't know if that exists, but it wasn't as foreign because I knew like them, they had to figure it out. What was that shock, potentially culture shock or the difference when you started, when you went to, when you went to Harvard, because you were around like older people, quote unquote professionals. Was it just, you said a difference in the upbringing? I went to public school. I was around a lot of people that looked like me, different types, right? Like my high school is 93% Mexican at the time. And now the numbers may have shifted, but I'm, I'm very much Latin environment. Uh, my city wasn't that Latino, but the school was. So that was very different. Even though I was in this like tiny little group of honor students, everyone around me was brown, you know, and that is not at all what I experienced in college. Um, the fact that everyone around me was brilliant. Like everyone was super smart and now we're all around each other, which means now you realize, oh, I don't know a lot. Like I've been like, <laughs> I have to catch up. Like the, my three years in college, my last three years, I spent the time trying to make up for my GPA my first year. And I was just so happy I didn't get kicked out because it was so hard for me. So there was a lot of difference. I'm like, oh, I, I went to college with people who had tutors and went to boarding school. And these things that I just didn't even realize people did, you know, that, that were accessible to them in a very different way. And so, you know, the level of privilege, the range of privilege I didn't know existed, the preparation people had, like, I thought it was almost cheating to have a tutor because it was like, well, you just hire someone who knows more than you and they tell you the answers or how to get the answers. That's okay. So I had to do a lot of unlearning and now new learning to realize, oh, this is normal to everybody else. Okay. So I guess I'm doing a little bit of catch up of that exposure. But like I said, there was some level of familiarity, like of my parents' events and things that they took me to that didn't shock me in terms of the performance and showing up. What was different was how to do the work behind the scenes. Like, oh, this is how they play the game. No one taught me that. So, I mean, there you were, right? Growing up, it sounds like you were so confident. It sounds like you were so prepared to be in so many different settings. Did that change at all as far as like how you showed up? Did, did you hit like imposter syndrome? Did any anything hit your your identity, not aesthetically potentially, or maybe it did? Well, I definitely felt imposter syndrome. I wasn't just like hyper confident my whole life, little adult in a, you know, pantsuit at eight. But, <laughs> but I think, well, for example, I'll start with, with Harvard in that first year. I and a lot of my friends who I naturally gravitated toward, we all thought, am I the mystique that got in? Am I the one that snuck in? I wrote a good essay. People thought I looked interesting and I said enough smart things to convince them to let me in. But now I'm in the game and I'm like, oh, I, I have catch up, right? I have so much catch up to do. So that took time for me to realize no one taught me the rules of how this game is played. But once I learned them, yes, I can keep up. So it took me that ramp up period of like, okay, it's okay to get a tutor, bet I'm gonna get a tutor. Oh, it's not cheating to do a study group where we share the reading. Cause I thought I have to read every single page. Oh, we're not doing that. Got it. No one told me that. Cause where I'm from, you read every page and you do all the work. Like the stereotype that we're lazy, it could not be more wrong because we're here overworking the work, right? There's such a thing as working smarter, not harder. I didn't know that. So that was definitely a learning curve. And until I learned that, then it was like, am I supposed to be here? Am I the one that got in by mistake? Is someone going to catch me and find out? And then I had to tell my parents, I might go on academic probation. They might send me home. I got all C's, I think, maybe one D. I, I knew I could get one D. I asked my academic advisor, what are the worst grades I could get before I get kicked out? And she said, all C's and one D. So I was like, okay, I'm going to strategically try to only get that one in this one class, et cetera. Right? It was like, it was getting real. And my, my parents asked about my grades and I told them, and in private, my dad asked my mom, should we be proud of her for these grades? And he's, and my mom's like, yeah, she didn't get kicked out. Like we had to reset expectations completely because it was a whole new league that I wasn't in before. So that's college, right? Eventually I caught up. Eventually I got a job. I interned at Google prior to that I interned at Target. Things worked out, but I had to learn new rules of the game. Then uh, in, at Google, I got there before diversity was really trendy. It wasn't something people were talking about. So I didn't expect to see people that look like me at the company. I didn't expect to see people that look like anyone in my family at the company. It just was, I'm here to do my job and it's not really here for activities and cultural. I'm not here to like find my identity. I know who I am. I know I'm a Latina. I don't need the company to remind me that I'm a Latina and that it's okay to be. But I definitely still felt like fish out of water. I've ne So I'm the first of my family to go, let me start backwards. I'm the first of my family to leave the state for college. I'm the first in my family to go to an Ivy League school. So I'm not first gen, but there's so many other firsts that like the leagues kept getting tougher and more involved. And so first in my family to get a corporate job, 
first in my family to work in tech. So I benefited from the preparation my parents could have given me with what they knew. But after a certain extent, it was like, puppy, I'm in another league now. Like, who do I ask? Right. So mentorship was really important to me, of course, finding people who had been through it. Maybe couldn't relate completely, but just a sounding board, a, someone to lean on for help, for advice. So anyway, so at the beginning, I was just trying to find my way and find a way to distinguish myself in terms of the work I was doing, right? Make sure I'm, I'm being successful in what I think success looks like. I showed up and I'm like, I think this is how you do this. And then on top of that, how do I carve out a career that is interesting to me? So I had five roles at Google I created for from scratch, completely created new roles, new teams. And that's not common, but I was able to do that because I realized, okay, there's gaps, there's, cha- there's problems I think I can uniquely solve. Let me figure out how is this done? How do I add my unique sauce, my sazon to it, and then create an opportunity, namely around multicultural things, obviously. That's my background in developing the multicultural marketing team at Google and every role prior to that. So anyway, so imposter syndrome was real. Like I said, I was the only, either only woman at the table or only woman of color or the only Latina or the youngest, all these things at the table all the time. And what shifted for me was when I realized, I think I was just really present to the fact that we were at a, at a table having a conversation about how to support small businesses. And I just assumed that everyone knew what they were doing. We always give the benefit of the doubt that everyone at the table knows what they're doing. And I started listening a little more closely and I was like, what small business owner would do this? Who has time to check their analytics and do X, Y, Z, these very nice, beautiful things that these corporations want a consumer or a small business owner to do. But, and there was nothing wrong, right? It was actually, it was a, it made sense. It made sense that these are tools that could help a small business grow and all that. But my family and I have a tequila company. I know what it's like to bootstrap a small business. We did it all from the ground up. And I'm looking at these strategies thinking, I wouldn't do this. My dad wouldn't do this. I don't know what small business owner has the time unless you can afford an intern to specialize in understanding analytics. It's not going to happen. And so it hit me that maybe people at the table had never experienced this before, any of this. Maybe they didn't know what it's like to be a small business owner. So I felt very bold and very brave and I had to just channel my eagle powers, whatever, just like really get in the zone and speak up, even though it was scary at the time, because I thought I might be wrong, right? Maybe they know exactly what's going on. I'm trying to learn the rules of how this works. And they say everyone should have a voice, but you don't want to look like the dumb person who actually said something. So I asked, um, has anyone here owned a small business? And no one raised their hand. And so that was like, all right, data point. Cool. I said, well, I have a small business and I try to make it a positive. My family and I have a small business. I'm from a community with a lot of small businesses. And I think it'd be very far-fetched, not these words more or less, but you know, it's kind of hard to believe that any small business would do this. Imagine me saying in the most nice corporate language I could possibly muster up to, to convince them and then just let them know that's not what they need. What they need is money in the bank. They need customers. These are all nice to have. So I just kind of gave them that perspective of what's realistic for a small business to do. And then I realized my lived experience is my expertise. I'm the expert, I'm the expert of my own experience and no one can take that from me. And not only do I get to own that, but when no one else at the table has it, now I'm the best value add at the table. So I turned my like, oh, I'm from a small town with a small business into, I have a lot of experience in exactly who you're trying to reach. So I'm the target consumer as a business owner. It's B2B marketing, but ultimately you're trying to reach me. And so that shifted everything for me. In that moment, I realized I have the most relevant experience at the table. I may not have run ads before to run a marketing campaign. I may not know how to do a creative brief with an agency yet, things I learned later, but I do know what it's like to be a small business owner. And I think that we're often not encouraged to remember our lived experience can guide so much of our work if we tie it back to remembering we're consumers, our family members, our neighbors, our block, full of consumers that these companies want to reach. Can we make that relevant to the company? But translating it or, or you know, making sure we're delivering it in a way that reaches them. And I told myself a long time ago, don't get mad, get strategic. I could have been mad. Like, why are they doing this? Why aren't they reaching us? Da, da, da. And instead I was like, this is an opportunity for me to lean into this and get to own my experience. And now I'm the go-to person for all things, multicultural, small business, et cetera, because how many other people at the table had actually had that experience before? I love that. Being an expert in your own experience. I mean, it makes so much sense. Um, And I love the fact that you, in many ways, in that moment, felt empowered to share your opinion and speak up. I'm wondering, were there any situations where you felt that urge to speak up? You felt like 
it would be valued, but you shied away from it because of, you know, certain circumstances around you. Definitely. I can think of one exact moment where I joined a new team. There were a lot of efforts around diversity happening and these are all good efforts. So I'm not going to, the plot twist isn't that I'm going to bash the company. That's not it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to just throw people under the bus. There were a lot of efforts happening, but there's some gaps I saw. And I assumed I'm new to the team. I'm relatively junior. I, and then all the, the list of things that might keep me from speaking up, but it just seemed really off. So I felt really strong, like I need to speak up, but I just thought they're going to call me out that I got it wrong real quick. And I don't need to set my reputation like that from the jump joining a new team. So I wrote a note to my boss and slid it to him. And I said, what about X? Just, he might know. Like my point being, reach out to someone you trust who will tell you what's really going on before just calling it out. Because there are moments when I would just get on the mic, but in this case, I didn't feel empowered to do that because I thought, I don't know if I know enough. My reputation's on the line. I don't want to embarrass myself. Let me just start with like one little question to someone I trust. And he said, no, basically, no, those things are not being done. And he said, uh, say something. And I said, I have more questions first. And I think part of it was, you know, could people around me have done a better job of making sure any question feels valid and we support you no matter what? Yeah, but no one was saying those things. They're going along as they would. And so I think it doesn't sound like a really terrible moment. It doesn't sound traumatic necessarily, but it was an example to me of feeling almost trapped where I'm like, I really feel the urge to say something. I don't know if this is the time for it. Maybe they said it 20 minutes ago and I missed it. Now I'm doubting, have I been present? Have I been listening? Yes, I've been listening. Yes, I've been present. That's why I noticed this. But people are so quick to point, they're quick to throw a jab back. You know, Often it's like you say something and they catch you slipping. I thought maybe I'm slipping and they're gonna call me out for it. And so of course it, it ends up unpacking this whole thing. There's a lot of missed opportunities. I ended up doing a lot of that work and it was, it was good. It was an opportunity for me to lean in. but those ha moments happen often. That's one tiny example where, um, you know, we can talk on microaggressions. It's just something a little different, but like you could have said something, but didn't cause it was just so many little things over and over again. But in that moment, it, I think that if I could give myself the advice, then I'd probably would say you did the right thing because you didn't know the context of who was there. And it wasn't, you did the, you did the right thing and at least speaking up a little bit with someone that you trusted, you didn't say quite completely, but there's been other moments when, you know, I can't think of one particular example, but plenty fleeting memories come to mind when it just wasn't the time. Or I thought, even if I say something, they may not get it or they may not care. So I think those moments happen often. I think what's challenging is when they keep building up and then you're like, do I even have a voice? So to me, it's like, am I willing to turn down the volume a little bit and ask someone kind of whisper, hey, psst, psst, what's the deal with this? In order to later say it, have a stronger stance and then not feel so scared to speak up when it matters. Yeah, I mean, in many ways, I think sometimes we need that permission, whether it be like a nonverbal cue or like physically right. sliding a note across and be like, hey, is this okay, right? Yeah. But I think, I think it comes both ways, at least in my experience, right? Like, I don't wanna talk for you, but um, there's that voice in my head, which sounds like you have a similar voice in your head that says, yo, maybe you shouldn't say that. And for me, at least, what I, I think I put the pressure on myself, like no one has told me this, right? But I put the pressure on myself that says, this is obviously a story I make up, but I'm like, fuck, uh, no one around me is Latino. So if I say something dumb, then they're never going to hire another Latino. Like I'm, I'm representing everyone that's going to come after me, right? And that's, that, that may be a true story, but it's a made up story that I tell myself. But in addition, like, you know, to your point, like there are actual voices outside of, this, outside of the ones in our head, coworkers, colleagues, other, you know, managers, et cetera in the form of microaggressions that in, in, in many ways tell us that we are not good enough, right? So um, I think those thoughts are valid. Um, and yeah, I mean, when it, when it comes to microaggressions, I think that, that's a valid point as well, because there are so many things that happen that a lot of these experiences often go untold as well, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to start this podcast, because a lot of our experiences, at least that I've seen, I think they often are told anonymously right, in, on places like Glassdoor, on, on Medium. And I understand why, you know, out of fear, there was actually a guest on my podcast that wanted to remain anonymous because he wanted to share an experience based on where he currently worked and he wanted to stay there for a long time. He wasn't planning on leaving and he didn't want his coworkers to 
hear his own experience. It's not like he was calling anyone out, didn't call anyone by name, et cetera. But I even had to like bleep out where he worked, right? Um, but those experiences are real. I mean, I could share a bunch, but what about you? Did, did you ever yeah. have some of those experiences yeah. as well? Yeah, I mean, one microaggression that comes to mind easily is once I was sitting in a, in a cafe at work and I was on my laptop, on my corporate laptop, dressed up for work. I wasn't in shorts and a t-shirt or something. I was dressed in what I think is appropriate, kind of business casual. And you there were two. You had a pantsuit right. on. Every day. I sleep in them. I don't know if you guys know, there's a whole line of pajamas. <laughs> Pijama pantsuits. Uh, that's a whole, that's a venture I should start. Anyway, so there's two women next to me. I barely even noticed they were there. And then one of them says, excuse me, do you work here? And I was like, yeah, thinking, how can I help you? Right? In my mind, I'm just here. Yeah, sure. What do you need? And she said, oh, just checking, you know, it's a confidential conversation. Just want to make sure, you know. And I was like, right. And then I just kept going and I was like, oh my God, I was back on my computer and I just sat there and I thought, you didn't trust that I would keep something confidential. Like you, like I may not belong here. I maybe shouldn't be sitting at this table where I can sit, I could sit anywhere in the office. And it was just really interesting to think that someone had to just double check to make sure that they felt safe to share whatever, whatever big secret they needed to talk about. And maybe it was client work, who knows, it could have been anything. You can make that seem not loaded, like, oh, maybe she wasn't sure if you are an external client who happens to be there for the day. People can wrap all kinds of cute excuses and parameters on this, but what matters is how it makes us feel. And it made me feel like, oh, I made you feel like you might be unsafe or you can't trust me. I don't look like I belong here. You're reminding me of that. And now I just feel weird sitting here. So I got up and left. I didn't need to. I didn't speak up and say, actually, lady, you know, here's my badge and you know, where I went to school and da, da, da. No, I didn't do any of that. And I, you know, when you sit there and you're like, I could have said all these things. I didn't say anything. I got up and left and just thought, you know what? It's a moment. Oh, well it happens. But again, the point of a microaggression is that it's like death by a thousand needles or whatever the a thousand cuts. Like it's when those add up, like I would get badged all the time. And this isn't specific to any one company. I know that what yeah. I'm saying is it resonates, right? Like I don't, I don't have any interest in bashing one company because a lot of the experience is not unique to that one employer. It's like, I can connect with friends across so many companies about these experiences when we're just others still, we're not overly represented. And so, yeah, people ask for my badge all the time. And I'm like, you only asked me in a line full of people. Okay. That's reality that you think is appropriate. Am I going to go on a rampage and tell everyone stop badging me and draw more attention to myself in a negative sense? No, but it's just, it's, it's a frustration that I haven't forgotten but I choose to let it go, you know? Um, yeah. The other side of what you were talking about though, in terms of speaking up, there were moments where I was much more bold about things. I was bold when I felt like it really was gonna be heard because what I hate is wasting effort and energy. So for example, this is when, I'm, when I was, yeah, very bold and, and still rel relatively young in my career, but I knew what I was doing made sense because I've been gathering data points. Essentially there's an all hands, it's a big conversation about um, how people, share their experience to your point about people talking about coworkers or sharing their experience with coworkers people really didn't do that very much and i was getting everyone's real stories i was like everyone's hr business partner i was almost like the counselor again because i started the latino erg group the group at, at google so i'd hear from all these people the real experiences the real stuff that no one's reporting to hr not that it was hr issues per se in terms of like scan nothing scandalous but enough to know how the sentiment of people and how happy they are at work and so, so forth. And so what I'm, what I brought up on the microphone in front of all of HR with the SVP of all of people operations in front of me, I said, I would really recommend reconsidering how you gather your data on assessment of, of the sentiment of employees, because I represent a community that doesn't trust surveys because a lot of us come from countries where you don't say your real opinions for a number of reasons across more than one country. Um, also, people don't trust it's really anonymous. Many of us are first in different ways. And so our family, if we first of all, where are you representing for our families? And many of us have commitments, financial commitments to our families. So we can't jeopardize our work just to what feel heard. That's real cute when you have bills to pay. And <laughs> not only that. <laughs> it's so true. If we tell our families, oh, I'm so upset. My manager doesn't make me feel supported. And they're like, you have a job. And in this case, <laughs> they feed you. What do you have to complain about? So I don't think it's healthy for us to still, oh my God, feel so grateful that we had an opportunity. I don't think that's fair. 
but we we let a lot go under the rug we we let a lot just get dismissed because our families give us a lot of perspective they didn't work this hard for us to have these opportunities and then complain about it it's hard to unlearn that but i brought up the point about measurement how are you gathering this information my background's in sociology i know about quantitative versus qualitative data so i said i would really encourage you to do more focus groups have conversations with people because you'll learn a lot. It may not be that we're all miserable. That may not be the answer, but you can learn a lot of really great information that you're not capturing if everyone's trying to give the right answer. That is that is a, a complex in research and data collection where everyone's trying to get an A, try to get the right answer. That's not what you're asking, but you're not saying aspirationally, what do you think of this company? It's, you know, you want your honest, candid feedback. And so unless it's designed in a way to get that information, you're not going to get it. So anyway, it sparked a whole like redesign. And, and at first they were hesitant to do it, but eventually they did. And so credit to the people who finally got it done. It took many years for this to change, but I, it was bold. I got on the mic. Like I said, it was relatively early in my career. I brought this up, but it was only because I knew how they're doing the study now. I knew I'm getting a whole lot of info from people who are not sharing this with anyone. So it felt like I have, I have the case for saying something. I de-risked my, you know, big moment by knowing what I'm talking about. It wasn't one or two people. It was many people. And I had, I felt like I had something like a strong case to build on and people didn't want to hear it necessarily, but it made change that needed to happen. And so I think that my parents have always encouraged me to speak up, but it's like, you better come correct have your data points or have your anecdotes, have your story to explain it. Because if you just sound mad and you don't have any examples to point to and no one's co-signing with you and you're out there on your own and it's hard to really believe the case, then is that gonna go anywhere? And did I just instead embarrass myself because I wanted to try to say something and do something good. So I try to keep yeah. a high bar for speaking up, make sure you come correct. I love that. No, it's not, you, you, I mean, you sound like a journalist. Like you need to have <laughs> point A, B and C. You need to have this whole thesis done. Uh, no, I, 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 I appreciate that. That, that makes sense. It, it is interesting too, uh, when you were talking about, you know, some of the, you know, not so comfortable experiences that you had microaggression wise, it just made me think about like, till this day, I'm insecure about my PowerPoints because this coworker one day <laughs> told me I'm laughing about it. Cause that's how I do it with things. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> she was like, you laugh with you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, she was like, oh, can, can you fix that slide? That slide looks ghetto. I was like, oh, hell no. Yeah. So till this day, I'm, I'm like very insecure about my PowerPoints. Um, and I <laughs> just like, not right. aesthetically, just visually. You know what? Unfortunately, that says more about their vocabulary and the selection of words they could have chosen from were not accessible to them in that moment. I doubt it looked ghetto. I would like in this moment to heal you of this trauma because that's just a fault, like I said, on their vocabulary. Maybe they could have said it's not polished enough, but ghetto is inappropriate. That's not, that's not right. So, and I bet your folks are amazing. And if not, let me know. I'll help you out. Because <laughs> a, a real coworker would have offered to help you. A real coworker would have said, hey, see this? What if? Tell me to consider change this font or adjust this, whatever, and help you learn instead of help instead of made you feel shame about it. Yeah, I think no, uh, they make us feel more shame. That doesn't help us at all. Instead of actually offering, I like the phrase a very good friend of mine, my Dominican primo hermano. He always says, "Propose, don't oppose." Mm, I love that. Propose a suggestion. You're not helpful if you just say something's ghetto and then leave it there. Propose a solution. Don't just oppose it. Then everyone's sad. Exactly. Uh, no, but I, I love that moment as well. Like in these moments that you feel so confident, you feel that urge to speak up. It's not only positively impacting you, like in many ways you're on the mic and people are in front of you, behind you, but they're seeing you. And in so many ways, like they're feeling represented. They might not see everything in you, right? Like, but in certain ways they'll see like, whoa, like if she can do that, that means I can do that. I'm wondering like, did you receive any of that feedback? Um, maybe not that situation, but other situations where um, you yeah. felt the confidence and urge to speak up for yourself. Oof. Well, there's moments when I've spoken up for myself. There's also moments when I've got, I've had the opportunity to speak about my work. Like I got to speak up and flex and represent. <laughs> and I, you just took me back to this moment. I'll never forget it. I got to present to the entire company globally about what we were doing in terms of strategy to reach the, the Latino community. 
And it was such a big moment because I created the multicultural marketing team. This work had never been done before. And in this case, it was specific to our community, although I did try to make sure we were being expansive and, and representing what multiculturalism looks like. But in this moment, it was about showing the data why our community is not just important, but so amazing because we're the fastest growing demographic. We are 10 years younger than the average consumer. We're over indexing and use of social media and tech and smartphones and YouTube content, all the things. And so here's what we're doing about it, right? Here's the creative we've done. Here's the campaigns we've run. Here are the partnerships we're doing. And here's the impact. So to stand on that stage where the founders speak to the entire company every week to share that work, not only did I feel this moment of, I'm a Latina on this stage, which is rare enough as it is. I'm presenting work that I get to drive and own. I created this role, which is remarkable in and of itself. I didn't do it alone, but I realize now I can, I can, I always like to say it's not a flex, it's a fact. I created the role, I created the team, I get to talk about that. And it's about work that's impacting my community. And so to see the people in the crowd, both people that are in the community who are like, oh my God, you're representing and you're flexing for all of us right now, <laughs> that we matter, that we're important, right? That we're, we're a demographic that is such an amazing market opportunity and it's just smart strategy and it's also making an impact, but also even people who consider themselves allies, who know how rare it is to have that moment happen and to know that they are people who are pushing this work along. Like all of the sponsors I had in that work didn't look like me. And they were bought in though. They, they knew the opportunity, they were excited for me. And so I had this like magic moment, feeling like I'm representing for all of us, the people that may never have a chance to be on that stage and may not be at the company yet, the people who are there, who dream of doing this type of work and the people who helped me do it, who didn't even know what it feels like to have this relate to their own lived experience or their families, but they're like, she's on one, let's push this forward because it just makes sense for everyone. It's a smart strategy, so. That was a really big one for me. And I saw a picture of that recently. And I thought like, you know, working in a corporate setting isn't always all glam and whatever. Forbes articles, cool, cool, cool. There's a lot of challenges that come with that. But I think that at the end of the day, it's like remembering there's so much we've learned. And I got to be in spaces where we never were before. And I just met with someone today who is a Latina, an amazing Latina, mother of two children, getting her MBA while working. She's now joining the supplier diversity team at Google after having worked for many years at the company. She's amazing. And she's joining a, a team that is now the manifestation of the pilot program I created years ago. And I'm not taking credit from that as much as to say, when I did that work, I believed that someone one day would run with it and own it and that it would outlive my time at the company. So when I left, when I left Google after 10 years, we had created 15 full-time roles dedicated to multicultural in some capacity across the company, either new roles or giving a slant to an existing role, making it focus on multicultural or Latin, et cetera. And this is now, as far as I know, role 16. And to think that I left a year ago and this work continues, that means a lot to me. And so she's now speaking up because the role has to do with helping um, get diverse small businesses into Google's supply chain as vendors and so forth. I'm like, that's what matters to me is that if I spoke up that one, it was heard, two, it created opportunity for somebody else. And three, that now she gets to keep having that conversation even if I'm not in the room anymore. That, that is impact. That is impact. <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, the fact that you're not even working there anymore and sort of what you've created and built is still not only there, but thriving and growing and creating more opportunities. I mean, there should be like a Economist article just like on your... <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of the Economist and economic impact, a friend of mine, and when I say these things, I'm giving the people the credit. I'm going to make sure that the story is told in a true way, which is we piloted this together. I asked them, hey... Danny, for example, what are you passionate about? And he said, startups. I said, cool, help me with some partnerships around startups for Latinos years ago, like actually like in 2011. And 10 years later, not only is he working on Google for Entrepreneurs, he just got to announce that there is a $7 million commitment to fund Latin founded startups. And I didn't do that work, but he was in the room. He was at the table. He kept pushing even after I left. But I remember when it was just the two of us at the table saying, let's do something about Latinos who are creating their own companies. So I don't, it's not me to say, I did that. You need to give me credit, but I know the story. 
And I want to give him credit for making that happy, magical ending happen. It took a lot of work to get there. I love that. Um, and I, I do want to touch on some of the work that you're doing now, because sure. I think it, I think it's always interesting where like, you know, we grew up with these values, we're, we're taught these values, we, you know, in many ways, like our upbringing helps shape our authenticity. Like what I've gathered from this is that you are confident, bold, very methodical as well. But like in certain instances, right, potentially new environments, you know, we're challenged in our values and our authenticity. We're like, ooh, maybe I should like shy away a little bit until I gain the confidence. Um, you know, when you went to Harvard, you may have gotten a little imposter syndrome at Google potentially. You know, when you go full-time entrepreneurship, like we just spoke about all your things that you've done, all the amazing work that you've, that you've done, all the things that you've accomplished. But when you go full-time entrepreneurship, do you revert back to some of those things and really like start that new cycle again of like imposter syndrome, then finding the confidence and then, you know, getting back to that bold... Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Person. I mean, it's not every day, but there's plenty of days where I'm like, what am I doing? Do I know what I'm doing? And I have to remind myself who I am and what I've done. I mean, in fact, I can pull up a book right here. There's moments when I'm doing work and I don't pull this book out, but in my mind, this is a book on all the research, insights, case studies, a bunch of stuff we did with Google. And that isn't related to what I do now, but I'm like, oh, the strategic person who did that is still in me. The, the person who figured it out as I went. And the difference now is that then I was paid by a corporate company. <laughs> so I had a salary, right, to fall back on. Now it's a little different. Like you feel it when you're an entrepreneur. When you waste time, when you waste money, that's all on you. But I just try to remind myself to stay surrounded with people who not only believe in where I'm going, but know where I've been people who know that when I face the challenge, I overcame it then and I will again. And to be mindful of who I let in my orbit, right? Like I was just telling a friend yesterday, be very, very thoughtful about who you invite to walk next to you and be a part of your story on your path because people will impose their limiting beliefs on you. And then things sometimes just get hard, right? Sometimes things get hard and you have to figure it out. And it's like, okay, who around me is going to help me either think of solutions or just listen because I just need a listening ear. And a mentor many years ago told me leadership is lonely. She's totally right. I felt that at Google, I felt that here, right? Early on when you're the one who sees this vision and people don't really get it, it's on you. And then another mentor said, it's lonely at the top, bring people with you. So I obviously believe in that tremendously. It makes me very happy to be able to do that. But even as an entrepreneur, I'm always thinking who can I partner with so that I don't feel completely alone as a solopreneur who do I know share similar values? I have a friend, we do virtual co-working time because we know we need to have accountability to show up for somebody because we can stay in our Vata Fiamas all day and don't have to get the work done. And eventually it'll catch up to us, but you can, right? So I think that the moments of vulnerability aren't always what you see on social media. Like whoever thinks entrepreneurship is just fun and cute and easy, no, you've been lied to. It is very hard, but I think that if you really believe in what you're doing and remember to believe in yourself and a phrase I always love coming back to is doubt your doubts and believe your beliefs. It takes a lot of work to keep your mindset right, to not fall into the trap of doubting. Can I do this? Is it making sense? We will have those doubts. It's not that they don't exist, but don't subscribe to them so much that it takes over. And instead, if you can't pull it in yourself or I'll speak and I, if I don't believe it, if I'm just feeling like, does this make sense? Is it, is it, do I have it in me to do this? then I reach out to the people who know that I can and remind me that. And I think we attract mirrors, right? We find people who mirror back to us where we are with things, how we feel about things. And I'm really grateful to the people who, who keep showing up. Even when I'm still figuring, I always say I'm building the plane as we fly it. I may not have all the answers, but I'm gonna figure it out. And taking that plunge is, it's exhilarating, it's exhausting, it's exciting, but knowing that imposter syndrome is real and it will come again, but having sort of a toolkit of things to fall back on and just remembering where you've been and who you are. No, those, those are great reminders to have. Um, I don't necessarily have a book with stats, but what I do is um, all, all the positive messages that I get, I take a screenshot and put it in this folder in my phone. So whenever I'm having a really rough day, whether it be sad, et cetera, I just go in there and it's a message saying, you know, thank you for the, for the platform you've created, et cetera, like all these positive messages. And I'm just like, that's why I'm doing this, you know, it's sort of like just those positive affirmations and reminders that you need. 
I have a Google Doc with all years of positive things people have said. So same. I love that you have that. Not a lot of people do. I think a lot of people actually think it's almost weird or not appropriate <laughs> or something. I'm like, why can't you have a hype folder, a hype doc, whatever? I call it great moments. And because sometimes you forget, because we will remember the failures more than the wins, we'll remember all the times that we didn't quite make the mark instead of the times where we crushed it and maybe we didn't think it was success, but it meant something to somebody. That's what's powerful. And I think that's what can give us the light again to keep charging forward, charging or flowing, whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that makes sense. Uh, yeah, I agree with that. It's funny. I mean, we have a whole conversation about entrepreneurship. I'm not a full-time entrepreneur, sort of, uh, you know, still have the full-time job, but working on the side business. Uh, but this journey has helped me gain so much more respect for entrepreneurs. Not that I did it in the past, but I went into it so cocky. <laughs> I was like, I, uh, I was like, oh, I worked at Facebook. I do advertising there. Like I, you know, consult these million dollar brands. I'm just going to put a product up. I'm not even going to test my ads. I'm just going to throw an ad up. It's going to make me millions of dollars. It didn't, right? Like there's so much work that goes into it. And there are so many things that you haven't had exposure to before. I, I call it, I call it my MBA. Like I didn't get my MBA and I really don't want to get it, which is another problem, which is another conversation. But uh, I'm learning so many things that I would never expose to, right? Like working at Facebook for so long, I never did SEO. I don't know what the hell SEO was, right? There's so many little nuances like about your website and optimizing it that, right? Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's fascinating. I'm learning a lot, but I know we're almost out of time. So I want to wrap up with this final question. Um, you know, as you look forward, right, we're still on a journey. We're still working on, on ourselves. What's one thing that continues to um, inspire you to continue being your most authentic self? What inspires me to always be my most authentic self is when people tell me that seeing me live in my element being my fullest version of myself in moments or as much as I can, that that felt like it gave them permission to do that too. That is so meaningful to me because I talk about a lot of things I'm doing and I try to be honest about it. it's not always easy, but here's what I'm putting myself up there. I'm trying. And when people tell me, not that they did the same thing, that's not the goal, right? I'm not saying everyone go live your life like me. And so they said, hey, I thought of you when I needed to get on stage at my company. And I was like, if she did it, I can too. I don't work there. I'm not going to give the same talk she gave. Totally different. But it meant something to her. Or when people say, you know what, you just even being in this space makes me think that maybe I can go do my goals or my dreams or you taking care of yourself and doing therapy or coaching or whatever inspires me to go do that too. And so that to me is really powerful because I'm like, if I can continue to nurture myself, to be authentic, to take care of myself, to be genuine and also like live the life that I want. And if that can have a ripple effect of encouraging other people to do that too, that there's nothing better than that. There's nothing more interesting to me, especially because what I'm trying to do is make sure I'm doing well, doing good, and then doing more of the creative stuff that I love. So there's no perfect path. Everyone has to choose the path that's meant for them. But like I said, it's not about hoping people live like me as much as if I can increase the volume on doing more of everything I love and being more of myself, and they mean they think that that means the same for them, that makes me really, really happy. <laughs>